Titus chapter 3, starting at verse 1 and going through to verse 11. Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Saviour and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He poured out his spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. These are good and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels and disputes about the law, because they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a divisive person after a first and second warning, for you know that such a person has gone astray and is sinning. He is self-condemned. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to now spend some time thinking about what Titus has just said to us, or the book of Titus has said. And the question it raises is, how should we as Christians behave when we're here in church, when we walk down the main street, when we're in our homes? Every workplace that I've ever been in has had guidelines for the behaviour of their employees. Apart from the fact that these are there to keep their employees safe and stop them injuring themselves, they're there so that the workers know what they can and can't do they know, remember what they have come to work to do so they stay focused and don't spend their whole work day on Facebook. And it also helps the company or the workplace maintain its image in public. So what about the church? What are the rules and guidelines that govern the behaviour of the people in the church? Well, here in Titus 3, Paul's getting to just that. He's just finished reminding Titus of the goodness of God and that all of Christian behaviour flows from what God has done for us and what we believe about him. And so now he's going to give us some guidelines to show us what that means. Please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and we thank you for your word. We pray that you will speak to us through your word today and equip us to apply it into our lives. Amen. So we remember from last week, it's brought to us by the letter D, because we remember that our doctrine, what we believe about God, helps us make decisions and outflows into how we behave in life. And so Paul's getting ready to tell Titus exactly what he should teach the people. What does this look like in practice? And so he starts by emphasising the thing that he thinks is most important. Have a look at verse 1. Remind them to submit to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. Wait a second. Paul's just reminded Titus of the glory of the gospel, and now his first instruction isn't go and tell other people about the gospel. It's submit to the authorities. What's going on? Why is this number one in Paul's list? I think it comes back to our memory verse. Chapter 2, verse 14. God has redeemed us from all lawlessness. How can we say that we have been redeemed from all lawlessness if we don't obey the law, if we don't follow the authorities that God has put in place? How can we say that we're willing to listen to God's authority in our life if we're not willing to listen to the people that he has put over us? Yes, this applies to the government and listening to them, 
But it also applies to more than that. It applies to every authority that God has placed in our lives. Our parents, our teachers, our bosses and managers, and anybody else. Imagine this. The church has the reputation of a criminal gang. It wouldn't take too long before the government started restricting what churches could do, when people would stop associating with us, until eventually we were shut down. Paul wants us to obey the authorities and be good citizens so that people can see that the God we worship is worthy of being listened to. Would you want to listen to a God who commanded all his people to vandalize the town, to speed, dodge their taxes? doesn't sound like a God worth following. Now, there will be sometimes an extreme situation where certain rules or laws might need to be disobeyed by a Christian if the government banned the owning of Bibles, banned the preaching of the gospel, then those specific rules might need to be disobeyed. But the default position of every Christian should be to submit to the authorities that God has placed over us. And yes, even the ones we didn't vote for. You see, when Paul wrote this letter, the guy who was in charge of Rome was the Emperor Nero. You may not know much about Emperor Nero, but he was not a nice guy. In fact, one of his crowning moments was after the great fire of Rome, he saw that as a great excuse to blame the Christians for the fire and start killing them whenever he found them, just as a good excuse to have some fun. And if Paul can say to Titus and the Cretan church, you need to obey the Emperor Nero, well then he would have no trouble telling us that you need to obey the government even if you did vote for the other guy. And then Paul goes further. In verse 2, he tells us we are to slander no one, avoid fighting, be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. Paul's really ramming at home. He wants the Christian church to be known as good for society, as good people. When you come to church, do you expect to see church members fighting in the front lawn, yelling at one another, gossiping in the background? No, you don't. Unfortunately, that kind of behaviour has come to characterise many of our interactions, particularly when we move online. And we need to remember that God calls us not to get into fights and quarrels, but to treat everyone with love, gentleness, and kindness. There will be times when we do have disagreements and quarrels with people who aren't Christians. That's just a given. We have very different worldviews. And there will be times when the church is called as not good for society because our worldviews differ so much. But when that happens... We need to make sure it's for the right reasons. We need to make sure it's because we are holding on to the gospel and what Jesus has said, and not just because we're being rude to everyone. Would you want to come to a church where everyone was rude and fighting and gossiping? But why would we want to treat people this way? If they're not going to treat us nicely, why should we treat them with kindness and goodness? was because that is how God has treated us. Paul reminds us, you have contributed nothing to your salvation. God saved us because of his kindness, his love, his mercy, not because we have done anything about it. We are to treat others with humility and kindness because that is, is the way that God treated us, even when we were rude and, and disloyal and ignoring him. He still showed us love. See, verse 4 has a rather important word in it. It's only three letters long. But, 
but is a very important word in the Bible because it reminds us that what has come before is in direct contrast to what has come after. We were foolish, disobedient, enslaved to various kinds of passions, but he saved us because of his kindness and love. Who we were before we were Christians had no bearing on God choosing to save us. It had no bearing on how good God thought we were. We are all the same. We are all united by the fact that God saved us, not because we deserved it, but because he loved us. And so Paul's reminder to Titus is, remember how God treated you even when you ignored him, treated him like he didn't exist? That is how you are to treat the people around you so that when people look at the behaviour of the church, when they look at how you conduct yourself in the workplace, in your household and in the town, they say, if that is how God's people behave, Surely that is a God that is worth getting to know. How are we going with that? How are our interactions in town, at work, online? Do they display the way that God has treated us? Or are they slipping? Are we slipping into fights and quarrels? Because Paul goes even further, having told Titus how he expects the church to behave when they're outside the building. He then turns and talks about how we are to treat the brothers and sisters who are sitting next to us in the pews. You wouldn't be surprised. It's much the same as we're supposed to treat the outsiders. But then he adds a bit more in verse 9. Have a look. Avoid foolish debates, genealogies, quarrels, and disputes about the law. Disagreements with people who don't believe the same things as us are only natural. But how do we disagree well with the people who are sitting right next to us? Because inside the church, we need to be very careful of how we disagree with one another. If it's done poorly, it can fester and split whole churches for no good reason other than others were not treating each other with the grace that was shown to them. We shouldn't be sitting there thinking, oh, I'm better than everyone else here. My family has been part of this church for a 100 years. No, we were all saved by the same grace. We only get to call God Father because of what Jesus has done for us. Now imagine this, imaginary Anglican church. You've gone on holidays. It's a Sunday. You've decided to go into the church and see what's going on. You walk in and the tension is thick. You notice that the people on either side of the aisle won't even look at one another, let alone talk to one another. You get the feeling they'd rather be in separate buildings rather than forced to sit anywhere close to the people on the other side of the room. As you scratch the surface, dig a little deeper, you find out the reason that no one will talk to one another is because they disagree about something. They disagree on whether or not a Christian should read Harry Potter. One side thinks they should, the other side thinks they shouldn't. And the disagreement has gotten so fierce that they will now not talk to one another. This is not the sign of a healthy church. Thinking about whether a Christian should read Harry Potter or not is an important thing, and we should think about it and have discussions about it. But in the end, the Bible doesn't give a decisive answer. You can't turn to Hezekiah verse 5 and find that God says a Christian should read X, mainly because Hezekiah doesn't exist. But when we take an issue like that and turn it into a gospel issue, then we've missed the point. It distracts us from what we are actually supposed to do. Paul calls these kinds of quarrels unprofitable. 
Why? Because if we're too busy fighting about Harry Potter, we're not going out and showing the love of God to the people of, of the town. We've forgotten the gospel and we're too focused on a minor issue. Whatever you think about Harry Potter or a myriad of other minor issues, that's okay. The Bible gives us freedom to disagree. What Paul is talking about is being divisive, taking those issues and drawing a line in the sand and saying, you're either with me or against me, and if you're against me, you're no longer a Christian. That is not the kind of behaviour that Paul expects in his church. We were all saved by the one gospel, the one act of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection saved all of us in the same way. None of us can claim to be any better than the other. And so when we disagree, when it's not about an issue that is central to the gospel, we need to show each other grace and mercy and ensure that we disagree with one another without causing divisions. Because as we cause divisions, we start saying that the act of God to save us was different for us than for them. But it wasn't. We must never forget. We are all saved by the same mercy of God. And that mercy needs to be shown by us to all people inside the church and out. Even when they're our enemies even when they disagree with us. Because God showed his mercy to us when we were his enemies, when we disagreed with him. And so as we display that to the town, as we display that kind of love to each other, that is when we are focused on the main goal, when suddenly we are profitable again. So let's not get distracted by minor issues Let's not turn disagreements into divisions. But let's remember we are united by the death and resurrection of Christ and all pull in the same direction, showing that kindness, love and mercy to everyone we meet. How are you going with that? Do all your actions show that you have been saved by a God who is full of kindness, mercy, and love? Do you treat other people with the gentleness and humility that God has treated you with? Are you in danger of turning a minor disagreement into a division? These are the things that Paul warns us against because they distract us from our main goal showing the mercy and love of Christ to all who are willing to listen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have saved us, not because of anything that we have done, but because of your mercy. And we ask now that you give us the strength that we need to show that mercy, even to those who we are fighting with, even to those who we disagree with, And we pray that you will equip us to stay united because of the blood of your Son. Amen.